Can you talk about what the NATO summit uh, uh, bore in terms of fruits, where those fruits will take this overall conflict in your estimation from here? Yeah, I, I would say that this, you know, and it takes place on the 75th anniversary of NATO. Uh, so this this wasn't really the show that they wanted. This wasn't the narrative that they wanted. And if if anything, I would say that the, the biggest characteristic of it was desperation and panic. All right. And that's increasingly what we see uh, from the Western leaders. And on on top of the situation on the battlefield, they have to deal with the crisis within NATO, or should I say within NATO member states, uh, because uh, we had the primary leaders of NATO, or at least the member states that are the most significant military contrib contributors, come limping into this Washington summit as wounded political animals, right? We have Joe Biden, where even the New York Times is taking out editorials asking <laughs> Joe Biden to step down, to, to, to leave the stage that uh, that he can't beat Trump. That And of course, they're not saying out loud, but he can't even effectively lead the country. Uh, right now, that his his mental and physical capacity are are simply not there, and he assures us that's not true. He just needs more nappies. Gram Grandpa needs a, a few more naps, a few more few more hours of of sleep, a few times a day, and and the leader of the free world will be just fine. It's it's humiliating for the United States. It's a, it's humiliating for Americans. And I don't think anyone seriously believes that Joe Biden is running the country anymore. I mean, we've all seen there's big flashcards with big text print <laughs> instructing this, you know, uh, Biden bot, you know, walk onto stage, turn to podium. You know, it's it's uh, and that's not a joke. It's not even an exaggeration. Uh, it's it's absurd. Um, so the Democrats are in a panic. And more than that, the real rulers of the United States are in panic. The donors. We're told the donors are not happy. The donors are calling for Biden. Who are the donors? They're oligarchs. They're American oligarchs. They're the rich Americans who fund and control the political system. Uh, because of the poor sale political system that they have in the United States. Uh, so, um, you know, they're they're scrambling now. Uh, Kamala Harris, no one really likes Kamala Harris. Uh, no one thinks she's competent to run the country or, or to beat Trump, right, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, the elections that take place. I, I've heard you know, calling for the recitation of Hillary Clinton, another corpse that they intend to dig up out of its grave, remove the stake from its heart and 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 uh, prop it back up. Or Michelle Obama, because, you know, I mean, if Donald Trump had no political experience when he took office as president, well, why not Michelle Obama, too? I mean, she doesn't have any political experience, but hey, she was the wife of the guy who was president. So, I mean, that, that makes her you know, qualified, I guess, or they're scrambling. Uh, the U.S. is panicked. Um, and uh, it's it's really a sad state of what is still, by most measures, you know, the most powerful and, and by some standards, the most the richest country in the world, that this <laughs> Joe Biden, geriatric uh, weekend at Bernie's corpse, and Donald Trump, blithering idiot are the best that the American political system can offer American voters. Choose choose between. It's not even a lesser of two evils. It's a, it's a lesser of two humiliations. Two, of two, I mean, how, how much further can we lower the bar, really? I mean, and, okay. So uh, the leader of NATO, by far the greatest military component, you know, what is actually NATO, the hegemon, is 
politically wounded uh, and and not off, able to offer proper leadership. I mean, we, we know that Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan are making the, and, you know, William Burns too, are making the decisions, right? But uh, there's still need of a figurehead. And and the figurehead is is uh, an embarrassment at this point. Uh, Macron, uh, you know, from France comes in, um, having been beat uh, soundly by Le Pen's National Rally Party in European Parliament elections, and then he made the catastrophic political mistake to call for snap uh, French parliamentary elections for their National Assembly. And um, I mean, he's he's a wounded animal as a result of this. He um, in the first round of the elections, France has a complicated uh, political system uh, for their national assembly. There are elements of proportional representation, and there's two rounds. Um, if the um, uh, if you don't have over fifty percent candidate, a candidate earning over fifty percent in the first round, then you go to a second round, and the cutoff to enter the second round is only twelve point five percent. And the national rally clearly won a plurality of the first round uh, vote. You know, the national rally is pilloried as far right. Um, you know. It, it, in reality, like like with Viktor Orban in Hungary, the big heresy of uh, Le Pen's national rally is they don't adhere to Western geopolitical foreign policy orthodoxy in support of U.S.-led Western hegemony. That's the sin that cannot be forgiven. And because Trump is at best unreliable on that, that's why he's viewed as dangerous, right? Trump in the United States, Jeremy Corbyn was viewed the same way in the United Kingdom, uh, Le Pen and, and her rival on the far left, it must be said, Melanchon, uh, 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 there, the alternative uh, for Germany, you know, that's the big crime is you have to support the geopolitics of Western hegemony. And if you don't, then you're verboten. No, no one really cares about their stance on migration or uh, transvestites or, or 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 whatever. That's that's the real you know uh, 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 issue that makes them such uh, you know pariahs to to be pilloried. But um, while Le Pen's party won the first round or won a plurality of the first round of the National Assembly vote. Then the Macron's neoliberal centrists and a loose far left coalition, the, uh, the, the new popular front under France unbowed uh, leader uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, made a devil's deal where they agreed to drop out of uh, uh, candidate races where they were the third polling candidate, where they um, they didn't want to divide the boat between Macronists and um, the uh, leftists. And the result of that was, uh, you know, that less national rally candidates won the third round. It's, it's a, a kind of tactical cheating, if you will, because, of course, the Macronists and the leftists hate each other. And Macron, in fact, said that Mélenchon's French Unbowed is as uh, dangerous to the French Republic, i.e. to Western hegemony, uh, as Le Pen's national rally is. Once again, because Mélenchon is against U.S.-led Western global hegemony. He's extremely uh, cynical and skeptical of the United States. Uh, he does not He's against the support for the Kiev regime in Ukraine, and he even wants France to ally with Russia. So, you know, he's he's just as as verboten. So the, the result of, of this tactical scheme to deny Le Pen's national rally a victory resulted in two things. The party gaining the most seats in the assembly now is the far left, as Mélenchon's um, uh, a loose popular front uh, coalition which is, again, just as potentially dangerous to the West. But they don't have enough seats to form a majority, which means that 
uh, France's uh, National Assembly, their parliament, is going to be in chaos. Uh, there's no way that any of these three groups will form a coalition with each other. The, Mac the neoliberal centrist Macronists, who came in second, the Mélenchon's uh, far-left National Front, which came in uh, first, and uh, coming up just behind um, Le Pen's um, uh, far far right uh, national rally, and and I want to be perfectly honest. In my estimation, the closest thing that there is to an heir of Charles de Gaulle in French politics today, of his uh, economic and political policies of Dirichme, is Le Pen. <laughs> and you know that's that's heresy to say among liberals, but you know. We don't give a fuck what they think. So um, that is, um, you know, uh, it, it, Le Pen was quite clear that this is victory delayed, right? They still more than doubled their seats uh, in the French parliament. They're, they're every election now they get stronger and stronger. Uh, and she will certainly make a strong challenge uh, for president next time. And we'll see if there's another united effort by the uh uh you know all of the other political forces in france uh to deny uh national rally a presidential victory you know it, that margin keeps getting smaller and smaller uh every time uh so the most likely outcome right now is you know a hung parliament i'm a, a minority government that has to a uh, wheel and deal with every single vote to form a majority, which means effectively that the French uh, legislature, the French National Assembly is paralyzed. It, it's, and, and they can't have another election for a year constitutionally, right? So um, now that actually, I guess, compared to the possibility of a national rally or popular front ruled uh, National Assembly is to Macron's benefit because Macron, uh, France has a very powerful presidency, right? It's what's called the super presidency, much like there is in the United States, perhaps even less checks and balances than in the United States, and much like Russia, which also has an extremely powerful presidency. Um, so um, uh, what Macron is almost certainly going to try to do is he's going to try to uh, make more devil's deals, play 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 the devil to Faust, and try to woo away um, members of Mélenchon's, again, very loose and fragile leftist coalition uh, away from Mélenchon. Uh, and there are socialists within that grouping that are pro-Atlanticist. So, you know, they're primarily vulnerable. But it's still unlikely that even with defections like that uh, from the far left, that Macron will be able to form a majority government. So um, France is, is going to be in a, a pretty precarious position. And, you know, um, we know that Macron has plans and very much wants to send troops uh, into Ukraine. Right. And once again, uh, Russian intelligence, uh, the SVR uh, made another announcement to that effect in the last couple of days about, you know, an initial force of 2000. First of all, there's already French troops on the ground, but it's still yeah. in the hundreds um, and um, that they want to increase it. But uh, and Macron has the presidential authority to do so now. And he's the most loathed figure in French politics right now. Uh, everyone, you know, uh, comparatively hates him. Um, uh, but um, he doesn't have to w w w run for re-election. Um, and, um, you know, he sees this as his legacy. And he really is very angry at Russia now for killing French troops in Ukraine repeatedly, you know, French mercenaries, uh, uh, and uh, for what he sees as J Russia uh, driving France uh, out of their uh, neo-colonialist projects in the Sahel region of Africa, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, that are all, you know, it, it, it effectively flying the Russian flag of bloc allegiance uh, right now. Uh, so they're very upset about that. Oh, imagine that. You fuck around in our backyard, we fuck around in your backyard. <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's the, uh, the game. 
So, um, uh, regardless, uh, Macron is going to have a real hard time getting the money, uh, the because the National Assembly, of course, controls the purse strings for this military effort. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see if his ambitions, uh, you know, to to become the next Napoleon, uh, really um, can play out uh, under this. He's he's certainly going to be wheeling and dealing, but he's in a much less strong position than he was six months ago. That's that's perfectly clear. In the United Kingdom, uh, there's a new prime minister, uh, Keir Starmer, the Corbyn killer, um, uh, who uh, soundly electorally defeated uh, Rishi Sunak, who is uh, now the Tories have suffered their worst electoral ve- defeat in history. Uh, Labour has a very large parliamentary majority now. Keir Starmer already, you know, was was slobbering all over Zelensky and promising even more support uh, and not to change British policy on on uh, the uh, support for the Israeli genocide in Gaza. Uh, so, you know, nothing is going to change foreign policy wise. But if you look underneath the cover, if you look, friends, I Sorry, the United Kingdom has, uh, shall we say, the peculiarities of a very controlled political electoral system, much like the U.S. with the Electoral College and 50 different state elections, and France does, in order to limit outside challengers to to the dominant, you know, um, uh, center-right, center-left coalition, you know, um, uh, politics, which keeps foreign policy and geopolitics generally on an even course. So actually, Labour only won 33% of the vote for this huge parliamentary majority they have. Uh, and that's because the, you know, the, the votes are, are going to the margins. Uh, the Reform Party uh, of Nigel Farage um, came in quite strong uh, 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 it's, it's a descendant really of, of, uh, the Brexit party. Uh, you know, it's a, a populist right party, but once again, it is, uh, not in support of Ukraine. Right. Um, so, uh, that, that makes it, you know, uh, far right and heresy and, and, uh, everything else. Um, so they did very well, but that because, again, because of the UK's controlled political district, dis- districting system, they only want a handful of, of, of parliamentary members. Um, and uh, while the Tories are soundly defeated, it's not like Keir Starmer really has a popular mandate. He has an electoral mandate, right? He's got, you know, the, the seats to do what he wants. Uh, but he doesn't have the support of the British population, uh, whom uh, are doubting the center right Tories and the center left um, uh, Labour Party uh, in their country, and and really I, I think they're in apathy uh, right now. Uh, but one thing they 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 get alarmed whenever British political figures ta- start talking about things like massive new defense spending, which the UK clearly doesn't have the money for. And for uh, as the outgoing uh, uh, British uh, chief of the general staff, we need to conscript a civilian army now to fight Putin. Things like that make the British public nervous. So um, I don't I don't think Keir Starmer comes in, uh, you know, uh, in a strong position uh, to to fight a war, a direct war against Russia in Ukraine either. Although, you know, such things as false flags and so on have a, a remarkable way of shifting public opinion, uh, as they always have uh, in the past, you know, with the United States, but, but they're in a much weaker position. And then if you take a look at the last major member of NATO, uh, Germany, they have this extremely weak and unpopular coalition uh, between Olaf Scholz, um, uh, uh, Social Democrats, you know, uh, with with very low approval ratings and no respect for Olaf Scholz, even among his own party now uh, in uh, Germany, uh, between the Greens, whose popularity has plummeted as a 
as a result of Annalena Baerbach's warmongering. Um, and uh, the, their, their last, the pro-business party, uh, it doesn't have a very strong electoral seat either. So the, the German coalition is extremely fragile there. Um, and so also politically weak. Now, if they if that coalition broke apart, it's almost clear that the Christian Democrats would then return to power, you know, the, the party of Merkel. And uh, they have exact same Ukraine policy there. So you'll see the alternative for Germany and, and an emergent left anti-war party, you know, chip away at the votes once again. But I don't think that we'll see as a dramatic a scenario as we saw in France, where we saw the center right and the center left both collapse like a like a house of cards at the same time, leading to the rise of Le Pen's National Assembly on one hand and a far left Mélenchon coalition uh, on the other. That's really Politically, it's very interesting. Macron has still managed to to wheel and deal to keep it, uh, but you know, there's no no question. So these NATO political leaders came into this summit politically wounded and weak animals, uh, with uh, the Kiev regime going from loss to loss to loss on on the battlefield and um, have, suffering such manpower and weapon woes at this point. Um, and it, it became very hard for them to sustain their narrative, any, any kind of sense of optimism. And the language now coming out of them and, and the Western media like the New York Times, what they're talking now is that Ukraine can still win this, even if they lose a lot of their territory, as long as they move closer to NATO in the EU, right? Which to be fair, is one of Russia's primary conflict aims, right? To prevent, to return Ukraine to the constitutional neutrality it had before the events of the openly West-backed Maidan Putsch in 2014, where Ukraine had this internal-external balance between the East and the West of the country, and it was this neutrality was enshrined in the Constitution. Couldn't join NATO, couldn't join Russia's CSTO on the other hand. Well, that was done away with with the, the West-backed Maidan Putsch. Uh, and, the, you know, that is one of, not the only, but one of Russia's primary goals here. So how much closer is Ukraine, at least to formerly joining NATO? They're a, a de facto NATO member now, right? But de facto doesn't count with Article 5. Uh, so while they're getting all the arms, they're getting only hundreds of Western troops to do the dying rather than the hundreds of thousands that they need to, to win this conflict. So uh, so did we did we achieve something on bringing NATO or bringing Ukraine uh, under the Kiev regime closer to eventual NATO membership in this NATO summit? I heard something about a bridge. A bridge to NATO membership. Well, it's not the Crimea Bridge, not the Kerch Bridge. I can tell you that. It's a it's a fictional construct spun out of desperation. There's no reality there whatsoever. Here's the thing. There's no consensus in NATO. Uh, NATO requires consensus. And there's no consensus on bringing uh, the, uh, Ukraine into NATO. Uh, supposedly, at least according to Macron, it's still the United States and Germany against it, because for the moment, they're happy with a proxy war. They're not ready for a direct war with Russia. Not yet. Now, on uh, the other uh, side, it's it's not just bringing Ukraine into NATO. It's support of Ukraine that there is no consensus in NATO on because of Hungary under Viktor Orban and Slovakia under Robert Fitzo, who recently survived an assassination attempt driven primarily, evidently, on his refusal to militarily support the Kiev regime in Ukraine. Um, so the, the whole idea that NATO and the EU need to operate on consensus has been completely removed 
uh, from from operations. Once once again, we see that their own their own systems, their own values are thrown out the window whenever it becomes you know geopolitically necessary. And there have been talk about removing voting rights, removing the rotating EU presidency that uh, the presidency of the EU Council that that uh, Viktor Orban as the Prime Minister of Hungary now does, uh, all because they refuse to toe the line on geopolitical you know questions of US led Western, global hegemony. And this peace mission of Viktor Orban to go to meet Zelensky in Kiev, but then to meet Putin uh, in Russia, uh, uh, and um, uh, then on to China even, uh, to meet Xi Jinping, um, and this is, uh, you know, beyond the pale for the EU leaders, and they are absolutely more furious and, and more afraid of Viktor Orban than they ever have been before. And it must be noticed that during those European, European parliamentary elections that led to so much political um, disarray in France eventually, um, the shall we say, the, the right forces, the conservative forces, the Ukraine skeptics gained quite a lot of power uh, uh, in the European Parliament. They're not dominant uh, yet, and, and not dominant by a fair stretch, but they had much more power than they did before. And now in the European Parliament, a coalition of conservative Ukraine skeptic forces uh, led by Victor Orban's party in Hungary and Le Pen's uh, National Rally Party in France, they are now the third most, uh, the, the uh, political bloc in the European Parliament that has the third most seats. Uh, so this, this unity behind Ukraine doesn't exist and the opposition to it is growing. It's not a tidal wave yet, uh, but it's, it's definitely, definitely growing.